Laura Hilliger is open strategist at Greenpeace. She promotes the open ethos to engage the global community and is currently working on a new Greenpeace.org project called Planet Four. Ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Laura Hilliger. Hi. Oh, good, it is on. So, hi, everyone. It's really bright up here. Um, I didn't realize I was going to get introduced like that, uh, so I put together some bullet points for you. Um, do you guys know that game where you tell people two truths and a lie about yourself? It's like an icebreaker game. That's what these bullet points are. Um, the way that I dress, the way that I speak, these bullet points, my Twitter handle, um, the pictures that I chose for my slides, all of these things are going to help you form a story about me. Um, and that story that you form about me is your story, it's your perspective, and it's not necessarily true. And I kind of want you to think about that uh, throughout this talk. So 34,000 years ago, in a large cave in southern France, an artist mixed together pigment and started painting animals on the walls of this cave. Now these animals, roaring rhinos and charging bison and leaping gazelles, some of them now extinct, were rendered in startling detail. But they weren't just portraits of animals. They were animals interacting with humans, animals interacting with each other, animals interacting with the environment around them. It's for this reason that we understand some of what's happened in the past, because interaction is a story. Every interaction is a story. The days of the week are stories that we've made up to help us organize time. Sicknesses are stories that we tell, our, tell ourselves to explain our mortality. Stories are in everything, literally everything. And stories don't have to be artistic. Um, they don't have to be fictional, and stories do not belong to certain kinds of people. In fact, stories or narratives are such a distinct human trait that theorists often say that after language, storytelling is the most distinctive human trait. Now Greenpeace, um, I'm from Greenpeace, hi. Uh, Greenpeace wants to tell honest stories using social media. Now, Greenpeace is not just an environmental organization, it never has been, uh, and it's also not an animal rights organization, although a lot of people seem to think that. Uh, our mission is to have a green and peaceful world. It's right there in our brand, Greenpeace. Uh, I know, right? It's so easy. Uh, and as an organization with a mission to protect the planet in all of its biodiversity, we use media as a tool to access power. We've always done this, since before the internet. Uh, before Greenpeace was the environmental movement or an office or an organization, it was a ship and an action. Uh, I'm going to tell you the super short founding stor story of Greenpeace, because it's an interesting one. Uh, so in the early 1970s, uh, the United States Defense Department wanted to test a hydrogen bomb on a small island called Amchika off the coast of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, and a group of people in Vancouver found out about this hydrogen, hydrogen bomb test, and they became concerned. They said, well, we don't know what testing a nuclear warhead is going to do on, to life on around, under, or near the island. Their arguments were really kind of uninformed and simplistic. They were like, what if it causes a tidal wave? Um, and so this, this group of citizens um, were inspired by Quaker principles, which you see here on the slide. Uh, and they formed a committee called the Don't Make a Wave Committee, which I think is really cute. Uh, and they went out and they started forming networks of people. They started talking to people in Vancouver and, and around the coast, and they shared their concerns. And these little networks of people popped up. So some of them were concerned about a tidal wave, others were concerned about radiation poisoning, uh, but they got together and they started having this conversation 
Uh, and the United States government really didn't care. <laughs> uh, they showed no signs of letting up, despite the fact that hundreds, thousands were starting to protest this hydrogen, hydrogen bomb test. Um, and so these rabble-rousers, not to be dismayed by the fact that the government wasn't listening to them, they said, you know what we should do? We should protest at the island itself. So they threw a benefit concert. I hear it was a hippie rage. Um, and they raised some money, and they rented a small fishing trawler called the Phyllis Cormac, and they sailed out to the island. But the other thing that this group of citizens did, the thing that set in a chain of events in motion that led to the environmental movement the way that we know it today, is they told stories. The founders of Greenpeace had a visceral understanding of how to use media to tell an engaging and an inspiring story. They sent images and stories of these ragtag group of activists from the middle of the ocean back onto land, and all of a sudden, it wasn't just Vancouver that was concerned about this test. Those images spread around the world. And Bob Hunter, one of the founders of Greenpeace, he said that these images that they were sending back were mind bombs. A mind bomb is a story that is designed to shift perspectives. Here's another mind bomb. Uh, what do you think when you see this image? Working with ships has given Greenpeace the opportunity to witness environmental crimes and injustices that otherwise never would have been seen. And because we are there and we document it, we ask that others bear witness alongside of us, and we hope that through the images and the stories that we share, others are inspired to act. Now, most people think of Greenpeace, uh, and they think of daring individuals who are uh, doing some sort of physical courage. So it's, it's the activist standing boldly in front of a bulldozer or a climber hanging above raging waters in an act of solidarity around a specific purpose or, uh, you know, a, a political, a moral act. And people think this about Greenpeace for two reasons. Number one, it's true. Greenpeace is full of daring, courageous individuals that do the craziest shit. But the other thing is, is that Greenpeace spreads iconic images and stories. So the story of the environmental movement is one that we're all familiar with. Uh, the, the setting is our world, our planet. Uh, the characters are big, faceless corporations who are super greedy and only care about money, and annoying activists who are always barefoot and think you should all be vegans. Uh, and of course, the idiotic, consumer-driven public who are so stupid that they know nothing about the greed of corporations or planetary destruction. Like, this story is ingrained on us. Like, it's part of how we, we socialize in the Western world, at least. Like, we know what the environmental movement is. Uh, and Greenpeace kind of fell into this doom and gloom narrative. We've been telling the story of the environmental movement as if it's an apocalyptic genre. Um, just think about how I just described the characters. Faceless, annoying, idiotic. We've been telling our story as if all the characters are bad. Now, the fact that everybody knows about the environmental movement is unfortunately a shallow triumph because despite the fact that it's like a movement and everybody knows about it, the critical voices in our world that deny climate change, um, that continue to push our ecological boundaries past their breaking point, they're still really loud. Uh, our opponents in this fight, in the, in the fight for the environment, for our planet, they've tended to frame their narratives uh, using emotional appeals. They use doubt and, and fear. Um, they, you know, use like the fear of uh, losing your prosperity or the fear of losing your job or the fear of inconvenience to, to convince us that this is how things have to be. The way that we do things now is, is sort of the way. Um, and I think that's really interesting 
because uh, the, the guy from Cambridge was talking about uh, predictive technologies and using you know, the, the psychological uh, markers of people to, to sort of market to them. And, and that's exactly what climate change deniers do. You know, they, like make you, they use Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Exactly, it's crazy. So meanwhile, um, environmental activists and progressives have tended to frame our arguments uh, using science and rationality. Um, but we haven't provided any emotional context for people. We kind of tell people what to do and then we show them a graph and we're like, see, see, biodiversity, it's like going away and there's like a lot of chemicals in our world and stuff, so you should be different. And people are like, what? Um, and we've, you know, Greenpeace really developed a history of doing this. We published facts and figures and reports, uh, but not the emotional context that people need. I wanted to say something about how the pervasive myths in our society um, kind of have led us to, to this like negative narrative and this, this, um, this, this broken piece. I sort of lost my way a minute. I wanted to say that, you know, corporate advertisers are telling us that we will be more beautiful, uh, prettier, I guess, smarter, I guess, um, you know, we'll be cooler if we keep buying new stuff. And governments are telling us that the growth economy is the only viable option. Uh, but digital marketing is not the same as digital advocacy. And we activists, we use our social media as a tool to ransack corporate bullshit and to propose a different vision for our collective future. That was actually still on this last slide, but whatever, I skipped it. Um, so, when I was growing up, I was a freak. <laughs> People told me I was a freak. Uh, they made fun of me, you know, they were mean. I got put in all of those freak classes, you know, the ones for the smart kids that was definitely not cool. Um, and I really resisted this because I had actually didn't think I was a freak. Uh, I thought I was okay. Um, and I've spent my entire life pushing back against cultural and social norms because we're taught conflicting ideas all the time. Uh, we're taught about stranger danger and don't take candy from strangers, but we're also taught about the kindness of strangers. So at some point in my life, I realized that I had learned a story of individualism that, um, you know, I would have to make my own way, that being smart wasn't enough, uh, that nobody would help me, that I shouldn't actually look at my neighbor's paper because that would be cheating, not collaborating. Uh, but I learned another story as well. I learned that uh, my friends and families would help me. I learned about the kindness of strangers. Um, I, I learned that despite the fact that we have all of these conflicting ideas, we have choice as well. And the best part is, is that we have free will, which means that we can change our mind. Now Greenpeace realized that the negative narrative, the apocalyptic genre that it was using in its marketing and communications was not getting the job done. It realized that we need to tell a different story, a story of a visionary species, a romantic journey of agency and change, the, the story of a girl who goes from being a complete freak to a total badass, where the girl is all humans and the journey is from a system and a planet built on competition to a system and a planet built on cooperation. And the cool thing is, is that everywhere, people are already living this dream. You just saw the WWF talking about Earth Hour, millions of people all over the world taking a stand for climate change. Uh, things like sharing, upcycling, urban gardening, people are beginning to use the technology that we have to make the world a better place. So those are the stories that we need to tell. We can propagate a hopeful narrative, and that's what we want to do. So Greenpeace, as well as the other communities that I spend my time around, like the open source community, the cooperative community, we're having these conversations about how does solidarity and collective effort help us shift these pervasive narratives that are really part of our world. I see that I'm out of time, but I'm still talking. 
So you guys want to know about our social media strategy. Well, hold on. I'm going to do a thing. Take a sip of water. I practiced, practiced this, and I wanted it to be a wrap, but I think I'm going to fail. So um, you want to know about our social media strategy. Well, we are in a time of peer-to-peer -peer communications, people bypassing the gatekeepers, real-time speed of light, speed of communication, Facebook Live, Twitter, the rise of personal media, citizen journalism, and a collapse in the faith of the official story. And all of this stuff is opportunities to reinvigorate our community or our communications with story. And so that's exactly what we're trying to do at Greenpeace. Because here's the thing. Idealists like me, uh, both inside of Greenpeace, but also in other worlds, in the world of technology and activism and art, idealists like me are looking at the world around us and we're saying, you know what? We are not in competition with each other. This is, this is not about our KPIs and how much we can grow and the number of followers you have. You know, this is, this is about, it's not even about technology, right? It's about people. It's about using the technology that we have to connect to people, to learn from each other, to work on global problems together, to, to like help people understand that they're okay who they are, whether or not they have the latest new gadget or, you know, if they're cool at dressing. Like, this isn't high school anymore. We should be using the technology that we have to advance ourselves as a species, and we should be using it to collaborate and cooperate. Thank you very much.